is a very good friend of mine and an ex-teammate of mine, so Les Ferdinand. It just proves Les what state Man United are in, doesn't it, really? Man United are not in that pond anymore, they're fishing in a different pond. Yeah, there was a lot of opinions, but Tim's, um, Tim's opinion was um, most problematic, I would say. <laughs> People say to me that the Championship is the most dysfunctional league in the world, and I said it certainly is. I'll give you an example. If Pep Guardiola was a manager of England, we would win, and we would have already won. So I said to him, um, I take it the scientific approach has got out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to another episode of No Tippy Tappy Football, brought to you by William Hill and Tim Sherwood is back. Hey Tim, how are you? That? Yeah, all good, yeah. Can't wait to get rid of these international games and get back to some proper football in the Premier League. Um, but no, I enjoyed, enjoyed the England's victory over Scotland, obviously. Are you um, waiting to say that to me? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. It wasn't great uh, <laughs> against Ukraine, um, but it can't be great all the time. Um, so I'd I rather it's, it's great in qualifying than in friendlies though. Yeah, I agree. But I think it might be to kick up the backside that the team needed. It uh, was getting a bit easy. You know, we know they're going to qualify anyway. They're racing ahead. But, I mean, it all starts once we reach the Euros. Uh, and when we when we actually reach there, we should, I would say, be favourites to win it. I am still... Um praying that Scotland get there despite the fact that they've had five out of five in the in the yeah. qualifiers and yeah. we're, we're nearly there no I think they've got every chance I mean Clark has done a brilliant job there um, I think it's, they've got some good players there as well you know good young players who, who, they're, who they're bringing through and he's building a good spirit within that that group of players so you know good luck to Scotland as well but England were just too good for them in a friendly. Okay, you uh, very kindly brought um, a, a guest with, a very special guest with you today. Would you like to introduce him? He is very him? special. Oh, he's a very good friend of mine and an ex-teammate of mine. So, Les Ferdinand. Good afternoon. Les. Oh, good morning, should I say. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's um, it's lovely to have you here. So, you and Tim, are you really friends? Yeah, we are friends. We, we play a lot of golf together. Um, we've been friends for a long time since... Uh, working as co colleagues, uh, as players, and then we went into the, the coaching side together. And then Tim took over as manager at Tottenham. And so we've, we've sort of like known each other for a long, long time now. So remind us, where did you guys play together? Tottenham. Tottenham, Tottenham okay. Yeah. yeah, we had, uh, I think when Glenn Hoddle was a manager at Tottenham, we probably had the dad's army of Tottenham. And we had the oldest squad of players dipped in with a few young lads who had a bit of energy. But... Um, it was quite aging, yeah. I mean, I think obviously Glenn realised then that with experience comes opinion, and so <laughs> sometimes he didn't want to hear it. Can I just put that? <laughs> can I put that a little bit different? Yes. With age comes problems, <laughs> not experience and opinions. Comes problems is what I think Glenn realised then. So he had to to change it up and go a little bit younger than what he had in the squad. Who was the most opinionated? <laughs> I'll say <laughs> in that squad at that time. What? Well, I was quite opinionated. I, I felt it was like, agree with me or you're wrong. Uh, well, I was obviously <laughs> wrong. I was obviously wrong and the manager was always right. But um, I learned that as going into management is, it, you know, you pick a team for a reason because you want to win a football match. Um, and, the, and there's no axe to grind with any of the, the playing staff. But as a player, sometimes you don't realise that, you know, you're just you're selfish. Um, um, but it is a team effort and obviously Glenn was a top draw manager but at that time we had a lot of experience you know the Gus Poirier Teddy Sheringham <laughs> Les myself I mean it was, it was just filled with John Scowls I mean yeah. there was so many um, all aging and um, and unfortunately not good enough for, for what Tottenham wanted at the time Was Tim the most opinionated? Yes uh, there was Tim um, we would have these uh, these meetings on on Many occasions where you'd go in there, and, you know, Tim would have his say. You know, Gus Payer, we used to go, Gus Payer, he used to, he used to go, keep him out, don't say anything. <laughs> Just like, because once he got going, he wouldn't stop. And then there was myself, would have to chip in, and then someone else would chip in, Teddy Sharon would chip in. So, yeah, there was a lot of opinions, but Tim's, um, Tim's opinion was um, <laughs> the one that was heard the most and uh, the most problematic, I would say. <laughs> I think you being opinionated will not surprise. <laughs> Any of our listeners or viewers? <laughs> no, none of my family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, Les, we always like to sort of have a little catch up with our guests to find out what you're up to. And of course, you've spent eight years at QPR as director of football, recently left. So what is on the horizon now for you? 
Um, I w- you know, when I left the, the position at QBR, I did say that, you know, I love football, love being involved in football. I want to be back in football. Um, but it's time for me to take a little bit of reflection on how those eight years went, uh, you know, and think about what went right, what I could have done a little bit better um, and what went wrong. So um, I'm taking that time um, to reflect over a lot of golf at the moment because um, hmm. you get a lot of time to think about things when you're going around the golf course. So um, <laughs> um, I'm doing that at the moment. And um, yeah, at some stage, I'll, I'll, I will go back in. Um, I'd look to go back in the same position. I enjoyed what I did. Um, it, although it was very, very tough, um, I enjoyed what I did. And at some stage, I will go back in. That job so, title, Director of Football Les yeah. or Technical Director, it's different at every single club you go to, isn't it? Yeah, that's the that was uh, one of the things. One of the courses I went on with the the FA's uh, technical directors uh, level five, um, and there was probably twelve directors of football on there. And I think what the FA wanted to do, they wanted to put something together so that because everybody says, "What what's a director of football?" When you speak yeah. to someone, what does it mean? And I think by the end of it, we realised that all of us there was twelve of us at different clubs. And it meant a different thing at every different club. Mm. And so um, it was hard to just get an itinerary of it's a X, Y, Z. It just meant different things. I was doing different things at QBR to what Dougie, Dougie Freeman was doing at Crystal Palace. So we, we kind of like realised it. So it was a blend of different things that different clubs required from their mm. directors of football. It's a role that we hear a lot about in football these days and often you hear it specifically when you're talking about clubs that perhaps aren't doing too well. You hear about the, you suddenly hear about the director of football, which was nothing I heard, um, you know, when I was younger. How important is a director of football to the running of a club? It all depends on what the the power that the club give to that director of football. Um, I I often said, and when I spoke to, when I used to speak to the owners of the football club, so my job is not to tell the manager what to do. My job is to assist the manager. So, and, and when I say that, I said, my job's to assist the manager, but first and foremost, to assist the football club. So as, as the owners of the football club, you say, to, you say to me, Les, we've got a £10 million budget this season. And so we can only spend X, Y, Z. So my manager might come to me and say, Les, we want Tim Sherwood as, a, as, our, as our midfield player. And I'll say, well, listen, we can't afford Tim Sherwood. But with our scouting department and with all the scouts, we can look at, you know, five or six players that's, kind of in the mould of a Tim Sherwood. It won't be Tim Sherwood, but in the mould of that Tim Sherwood. And then I, what I do, I present those players to him and say, right, okay, here's four or five players that are in the same mould that we can afford. Which one of these do you want? Okay. Mm. Uh, in terms of tactics, in terms of the way the team play, no, no, no. We, from the beginning, we, we kind of like decided what kind of manager we want, the type of football that he plays is going to suit QPR. Mm. Never ever say to him, oh, you should play this one, or you should play that one. Because if I'm doing that, I might as well be the manager. It's it's just to assist and to take away all the problems of um, dealing with agents and dealing with all the other side of football and allowing a manager just to coach and manage a football team. So years ago, managers used to, when they're not playing themselves, they used to go and watch football matches, yeah. go and scout other teams. It doesn't happen anymore, Les, does it? It's a dying art. I mean, they don't trust their eyes because there's so much. Is it because of the data? There's so much data around and they're just trusting that? I think what it is with the data is that, uh, what the data does, it narrows down your field of what you're looking for. So, mm. you know, someone might say, all right, we're looking for a centre forward, this is the type of centre forward. And now that the data's here, as a manager, you can say, right, I want a centre forward that runs in behind. Mm. So straight away, you eliminate all the ones that don't. Yeah. So it narrows down your search and then you go, right, we've got four or five that fit the mould that mm. you want. Now it's up to you. Do you want to go and look at them? Yeah, okay, we can send you white scouts clips and we can send you mm. four games of people so they can watch from their armchair now yeah. you know, instead of going to the games. Uh, and you're right, a lot of managers don't go and watch the games. It's down to the director of football and it's down to mm. to um, your staff. And if they if they like, if, if, if you get the final say on yeah. whether the player comes through the door. Or not. I mean, it's easier when you've got a playing style at a football club, isn't it? The yeah. characteristics of them them individuals are easier to find for the head of recruitment and the technical director if you've got a clear plan of how you want to play. That is a lot easier. A lot easier. It's a lot easier. If if you've got that in in place and it's what we try to do. So anyone coming through the door, we knew was going to foot the style of football that we wanted to play. It's when you start to to have opinions that don't suit that style with the manager, that's when the conflict starts. So it must be so easy with Guardiola, you know, the playing is, is clear. Mm. The, the patterns of what, of how he wants to play, as opposed to Man United, Ten Hag, I wouldn't be able to scout for Ten Hag at the moment because I don't know how he wants to play the game. 
Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, you have to have a template of what you want, what you're looking for. And maybe internally they have that. Yeah, They have that. He's just not be able, been able to produce that out on the football field in a way that we see yeah. Man City. And that sometimes takes a bit of time because what you have got, you've got an overload of players that were in the football club that perhaps he didn't want. Mm. And we all know when you've got players in your squad that are surplus to requirements, yeah. they become the bad eggs. Yeah, and they can infiltrate the. Like how bad, but how hard a job is it for Chelsea at the moment getting rid of them group of players? It's. Uh, I look at Chelsea and I think to myself, that's the one club you wouldn't want to be anywhere near at the moment because not only are have they got these players that are still sitting at like you know look at Lukaku for instance they, yeah. they've got Lukaku on this you know seven year contract or five year contract yeah. whatever it was doesn't want to play for the football club yeah can't get rid of him still got to pay him. And if those people are in your dressing room, they're just, they're, they're po- mm. unfortunately, they're poison. And I'm not saying he's a bad fella. I'm just saying when you're at a football club and you don't want to be there anymore, you're you're coming into that training ground with negative vibes every single day. Yeah. And you're around players that are trying to be positive. And if you get, and at, at the moment, Chelsea, you've got quite a lot of those types of players. And that makes it very, very difficult to get anything going in the right direction for me. So the hardest part of the job is getting rid of them yeah. rather than bringing them in. You know, I walked into Queen's Park Rangers. When I walked into Queen's Park Rangers, we, you know, for, for the club that QPR are, they had a wage bill of like £78 million, which back, we're going back eight years ago, was massive for the Premier League. I think when they got relegated, they were the fifth best players in the Premier League. Okay. And now you've got a group of players sitting at the football club that don't want to be there because they don't want to play in the championship. So the players, we're trying to bring in new players to try and get the club going forward. But you've got all these old players there that don't want to be there. And all they're talking about is how bad this football club is. Mm -hmm. So the new players that are coming in and thinking, well, we're running on that sort of thing for this football club. And these players are saying how bad it is. And they're not even doing anything. Yeah, this club must be bad. So they get infiltrated by, influenced by what these guys are saying. So it, 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 it... Brings a negative, real negative it's atmosphere. And until until you can get rid of them, yeah. the, the the bad eggs, you get rid of them. But then you have to get rid of these ones yeah. now because they've been they've been poisoned by the ones that are already there. Absolutely, but it's so difficult when they're high paid to get rid of them. You know, well, to try and get them to elsewhere, especially when they're in London and the foreign players want to come to London. Their wives are happy there. It's easier to to um, to have a good home life. You know. I, that you look after them at the QPR as well as every club does now. You know, the player liaison officers are there. They do everything for them. Um, so it's, it's perfect, especially where, when they're down south and they're in, they're in London. And that, the foreign that, was players hard, want that, was, that was the hardest part for us because you had players on good, good, good salaries that weren't going to earn that money anywhere else. Yeah. So um, you couldn't get rid of them unless you paid them up or they were going to sit there till the end of their contracts. Yeah. So it was very, What do very, you do? In the end, you end up having to pay them up because you need them out your football club, um, and so you're trying to do deals. And you know, some some players obviously went on to other clubs where he was able to to lessen the blow because they were getting paid somewhere else, and so you had to make up the difference. Mm-hmm. So hence why uh, QPR ended up in financial situation that yeah. they were in. You know, because you end up play. breaking financial fair play. You yeah. see, at the moment, the only players what are moving from clubs are the graduates. You know, the Cole Palmers, yeah. you know, Gallagher will end up going from Chelsea yeah. because you can't get rid of the others. Mm-hmm. And it helps with financial fair play if you send someone who's cost you nothing in the first place and you get the maximum yeah. opportunity to reinvest. Cole Palmer's um, a, a great example there of the sort of Chelsea recruitment style at the minute. With your director of football hat on, what do you make of that? And you mentioned it there. I mean, Cole Palmer himself, who has not played regular Premier League football, is now sitting on a seven-year contract at Chelsea. And I understand... Chelsea's uh, point of view in terms of they're trying to to manage uh, financial fire, uh, financial fair play and the reason why they give them seven year contracts because each year it amortizes so the pr- the price that they've paid for him will go down each year that he's there but if after two years you change your manager or after eighteen months you change your manager and a new manager comes in doesn't want Cole Palmer yeah he's sat there for another five years yeah. on those wages yeah uh, but as a young player. I can see what Chelsea are doing. As a young player, you're hoping that he's done enough for someone else to want to come and buy him. But if you, if not, you, you face the same problem that they've got right now. Why are Brighton the best run club in the country? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll give Dan, Dan Ashworth his props because I think they've done yeah. a great job in terms of, of what they did, in terms of going out to, into Europe. 
buying up a lot of young players, yeah. good talent, young players. Not all of them have worked. Because no. we had one or two on loan and they haven't worked and they've gone back. But the ones that come through in the end make up for the ones that, that go by the wayside. Uh, and what they went out and they did, they bought. Is Dan Ashworth the director of football? Yeah. He's director yes. of football at, New Cl- at Newcastle now. He was at, he okay. was at Brighton. Um, he, was at, he, was at, he was at the FA. He was at England. Then he went to uh, Brighton and then moved on to, to Newcastle. And um, what they put in place here was, was very good. Um, but if you go back 10 years, Tim, uh, Carr at uh, Newcastle yeah. was the best recruitment person in, in, in football. I think it all goes in cycles. I think, uh, you know, all these teams have a, a really good recruitment policy for a while. Yeah. And then it starts to go pear shape and then they, they get rid of because I, I remember Carr, Graham Carr was Graham at, Carr, uh, yeah. at Newcastle at one stage. Everyone was yeah. waxing lyrical about him being he the best. He came to Tottenham. Yeah, exactly. They've all been there. Yeah. They've all been to Tottenham. <laughs> <laughs> all roads. And, they, to and Tottenham. they're all good people and they all end up leaving. <laughs> Mm, wonder why we actually you read my mind there Tim because we had a listener question we've been taking listener questions this season oh. and we got some brilliant ones by the way and a listener did actually ask uh, Brighton, Brighton are known as the best run Premier League club and it could be between Man United and Everton is the worst hmm. what do you think separates them off field so much when a smaller team like Brighton seems to be so much further ahead in t- in ter- uh, they've obviously done their due diligence a lot better than the other clubs um, in terms of what They've they've obviously got a policy and they've stuck to that policy, um, and I think the important thing is, and the, the one thing I've learned in this is, if you have a plan, is to stick to that plan. Um, we came unstuck at QPR because we changed the plan um, because he started to have a bit of success. We was in that top six. You know, when I first went to the club, it was about producing players and selling them. That was the way we were going to make the club sustainable. Um, we sold a, a Bireze to, to Crystal Palace, which was the first of the big sort of like s- s- uh, sellings for us. Um, he went away and then, you know, 14 months later, we could sell Chrissy Willock, we could sell Ilias Cheer, we could sell Seni Dieng for good money because people were knocking on my door. And I, was, I go back to the club and I say to him, look, we're getting good offers for these players. And then it, the plan was changed because it said, they said to us, well, we can't sell our best players now we're in the top six. Yeah. And I can understand it because, you know, people say to me that the championship is the most dysfunctional league in the world. And I said, it certainly is. And the reason being is because the championship, the prize at the end of the championship is no, it, there's no other country in the world yeah. where you, so, you so get... So Willy Wonka too. Yeah, yeah. You, get, you get promoted to the Premier League and what it means, the amount of money you get, it doesn't happen in any other country in the world. So teams in the championship have to gamble. And so you take the gamble, do we sell our, our best players and probably make 50 million? Or if you get promoted, you make 120 million. Mm-hmm. So that's the gamble. And, um, you know, we gambled the wrong way. The gap plays between Championship and Premier League is almost a different sport when I watch it. It's massive, man. It's massive. Uh, and, 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 you know, fortunately, I've played in the Premier League, so I understand it. Mm. I understand it a little bit better because I played it, I understand it. And, you know, you've, you've got that feeling. And, and you're right, it, it, it is way off. And that's why when the teams come up, you know, most most teams that come up are favourites to go back down again because they just haven't got the resources to spend the money to bring those the players that they need into sustaining staying yeah. in the Premier League. And similarly, the teams that come down are always favourite to go back yeah, up. Like Although so. the Championship is fascinating this year because obviously <laughs> Leeds uh, struggles. It's only five, well, five, six games in. Leeds are struggling yeah. a bit. I, I do find the Championship fascinating, <laughs> especially when you kind of look at Middlesbrough, mm. who were so close to promotion yeah. last year, yeah. and they're yeah. I think are they bottom of the league. Yeah, haven't won a game. You lose league. players and you yeah. lose goals out. Yeah. A team like that, Archer was huge for them. Akpom, you know, they've Balagan. lost their, 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 yeah. two, their two uh, main strikers. They've they've lost, and so you're going to struggle. Yeah, you're and then struggle. and then you point the finger at the manager. Yeah, you know, saying he's not good enough, or he was good enough last year. Yeah, well, everybody pre- wanted pre- him last pre- year, yeah. perhaps because he had the, <laughs> he had the tools to work with. You yeah. know, that's that's the whole point. Um, you mentioned Eze a minute ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a phenomenal success that he's having. I mean, he's being linked to, I mean, everybody in the summer. Palace obviously did a great job to keep him. I guess QPR have got a nice little sell on though, so perhaps they were hoping he might go somewhere. He certainly was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was as well while I was there. Um was thinking, oh, we got, he's got to that stage. And he really unfortunate because the year before, he was on the verge of going away with England uh, two years ago and then done his Achilles just before the tournament. And mm. so um, I think he was going to be a shoe in for, for Gareth Southgate then. And I think he would have moved on um, from Palace before before now. But um, yeah, uh, just continues to get better and better. You know, when when he left QPR, I thought he was going to go and play in with better better players. 
is he going to hammer? Be uh, he's going to become a better player? And I feel if he jumps again, he'll be even better. Really. Where Les? Where does he play? Oh. What's his best position? I would say number ten. Just give him a free roll in that number ten role. Yeah. Let him go. Let him go and drift around the, the football pitch, Tim. Uh, you know, uh, I've seen some talented players in my in my in my career, and I've I've been fortunate to play with some talented players, and and he's up there with the best players that I've played with in terms of the way. He, you know, he's controlled the way he goes past people. He just drifts past people like they're not even there. Yeah. You know, you remember a Delta Raptor at the time yeah. when he was coming through, I looked at him and we thought, this kid's got some talent. You know, Eze would do things at times that take your breath away. Play with JJ Okocha, play with, you know, good players like that, who, um, for me, you know, used to say Paolo Di Canio and people like that, feet like velvet, you know, because the ball just yeah. come, you know, just kill it anywhere. Eze was up there with that. It's so difficult in that position where you're talking about there's so much traffic for him yeah. to get in and break through and really convince the manager, Gareth Southgate, that he is the man to take over. I think he's going to have to get lucky. He's going to need some injuries, you know, to, to because the others have already rehearsed for the manager and, and done the job, which he's happy with. The likes of Madison's playing out of his skin. Yeah. You know, it's difficult for him to get a chance to play as well. I mean, in that area of the field, we must have the best players in the world. What did you make of Southgate's comments this week or last week about Phil Foden? Obviously, my ears pricked up as soon as he started talking about him. But the idea <laughs> that he's not going to play him in that position because he doesn't play there for Manchester City when he's Southgate is happy to play players that aren't even playing for their clubs. Yeah, well, I, I was surprised by by his comments. I mean, he's obviously taken a lot of notes of what the media are saying. He needs to do his job and, and do it to the, the best. It's his head on the block, after all. Um, so he's got to do what he believes in. For me, Phil Foden is someone with so much talent that you have to build a team around him. Jack Grealish, you, I've worked with this kid. I know exactly what he possesses. And he, they all want to play in that free role. And they're all good enough to play in this free role. Les mentioned Eze there. You know, we're talking about Marcus Rashford. His best position has to be off the left-hand side. He's proved that for United. It doesn't work down the middle, but huge talent. Different qualities. Good pace, runs in behind. Gareth cannot die wondering. He's going to get this Euros is his opportunity to win something. And it's been, we all know, so long until since we've won. With this group of players, I just think you need to take the shackles off them. And if that means dropping one of your defensive players out and putting an attacking player in, an extra one. Now, I think you cannot give... I'm using Jordan Henderson as an example. I think he's done brilliant for England. I think he's a great footballer and every team needs one. But you don't need two of them. You don't need two pivots in there. I think we need to have a more of a maverick in that position. I think it would help us. I think you cannot give the the guy who breaks the game like, like a Phillips, like a Jordan Henderson, what Grealish has or what Foden has. You cannot give them that into their game. But what you can is give it to Grealish and give it to Foden and to Eze, what they do, work rate, responsibility. You can teach them that. You cannot teach the other way around. So I think we need to we need to embrace them and we need to show them some love and we need to play a more attacking style. I mean, he can't do any more than he's done in qualifying. We know that. But we know we're going to qualify with a group we had. It is about when we get to the tournament, I think. I'll give you an example. If Pep Guardiola was a manager of... England, we would win and we would have already won. Oh, I like that too. <laughs> Do you agree, Les? Yeah, um, I've often said we we have a group of players. But he's the best in the world. Yeah, he is. Yeah, we've had a shadow of that. But I, I think we have a group of players that are on the front foot. When you look at our attacking options, yeah. I think we're a match for any team in world football. Defensively, I think we struggle. If we're going to go defensive, which we have done, we're gonna get we're gonna get punished. So I think take that away. Keep the ball. That's what mm. Man City do. They keep the ball. Don't allow you to have it. And so when you have it, you've got more chance of scoring when you don't than yeah. when you don't. So I think the group of players that we've got right now, as Tim said, you've got to you've got to let the Mavericks have it. You've got to let them go and do what they do. They'll terrorise anyone in world football. But we we unfortunately with the manager, and maybe that's because he was a centre half. He thinks more from a defensive side than he does from an attacking point. He's covering up the weakness. Yeah, exactly. With an extra defensive player yeah, in there. 
I think City fans are a bit frustrated because Phil Foden has been playing in that position and he's been yeah. playing in that he position. He can play anywhere, Phil. So well. I mean, what, what, what Gareth has to realise is he's got Kevin De Bruyne and Rodri are the two best central midfield players. And he's had Gundogan in there before him. So, I mean, Phil would struggle to get in there. And do you think Rodri would play for England if he was English? I think he might. The only, yeah. <laughs> the only, the only thing I will say, in, the, in which which probably helps Gareth Southgate, is, is the other day when um, De, Bru- uh, De Bruyne was out for his first game, Phil Foden played in that position, was unbelievable. Yeah. And then he got dropped for the next game. No, he was ill. He was, he was ill. ill. He was okay, ill. Okay, so no one knew so, that. He, yeah, and I, I wondered why, because I heard people talking about it. Yeah. Um, so he was ill, he travelled separately, and he, but he travelled to the game, ah. and then he came off the bench. Okay, yeah, he came um, off the bench, and that's what yes. everyone couldn't understand, because he did the game, and um, everyone, it, the, the whole talk was, how's yeah. he not playing? How's he not playing? How, mm. No one could understand how he because of, of how well he played, and I don't know whether that was helped to, to form um, Gareth Southgate's opinion on him not being able to play in that position. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, in terms of another England player, a, a quick word from both you on Jude Bellingham, who continues to just impress both on and off the field <laughs> beyond, yeah. I think. I think no one's laughing at Birmingham now for retiring that number, are they? <laughs> He's a superstar, isn't he? I mean, you go to one of the arguably the biggest club in the world, you know, that white shirt. It carries a lot of weight. Um, some can never, ever play to their ability when they put it on. He can just relishes it he sticks his chest out wants to show everyone he's wearing a number five shirt as well the Dan shirt isn't it I mean it's incredible I mean the guy has got real courage he's obviously a fantastic player but it takes a lot of personality to be able to perform on a regular basis and the consistency what he's showing I think he's got five goals in four games or something ridiculous like that I'm like superstar it's absolute superstar but where do you? Fit? I mean, he has to play for England, but well, like he's another attacking player. Where do you fit him all into the team? <laughs> and that's that's you know that, here's another example of a, a young player. He, he goes to another club, he excels at, at Dortmund, he goes up another level, and he's yeah. playing with better players. And he just he just yeah. he, he goes again, and it's exactly what we're talking about with Eze. He goes to another club, he'll be better, he'll be much better. And Bellingham is now just you know everyone's waxing lyrical and rightly so about him because he's showing the the, the, the type of football that we want to see our England players have. Absolutely, what a talent. Um, So we've been asking our listeners and our viewers for questions this season. You can always get uh, send them to me on Twitter. It's probably the best place to get questions to me. Um, And I like this question from Ed Wobble for you, Les. Ed Wobble. So, yes, Ed Wobble, what a a great name. (laughs) Ed Um, Wobble. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So he says, Les was known as Sir Les to the Newcastle fans. Apart from the fact that he scored 50 goals in 84 games, where did the nickname come from? It started. It started at QPR. Um, I went out to Turkey, uh, Besiktas, and it, uh, it followed me there as well. Uh, came back to Newcastle. And a lot of Newcastle supporters believe that they were the ones that gave me the name, but it wasn't. It started at QPR, and it's um, it's followed me all my career. I've been called a lot worse around the the, the, the country um, when I've played at different stadiums, but um, mm-hmm. it's a nickname I'm quite happy to have. Very. I love that nickname. Yes, although the Newcastle fans are going to be heartbroken now if they thought they gave it to you. Um, talking about Newcastle, in terms of Eddie Howe, um, I can't believe people are questioning him already. You know, we're a handful of games into the season. All right, they've not had the level of start that they perhaps were hoping for. But what do you make about the the idea that the, 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 the people are saying they're going to replace him? Yeah, I can understand it. I can't, I, from a football point, I can't understand it at all. But you know, looking at the situation where he's in, when they spend a lot of money and Eddie's no fool, he knows this himself, it comes with pressure um, and, and demands that the owners who have got so much money, so much finance, can go out there and get anyone they want. I think they've got the right man. He doesn't become a bad manager overnight. I listen to people say, and I think he's been found out tactically. It's nonsense, total nonsense. At the moment, I think they've had tough games um, and it hasn't gone for them. He would like to have started better. I just think it needs to be very calm heads in the boardrooms there, the sporting director there. And they need to, and good job it's Dan, you know, because I yeah. think that he will give him the time. He, it will not be a knee-jerk reaction to find the next trophy manager who's who's out there to come in. You know, I think Eddie Howe's sexy enough for them. I really do. But can you I have to give him the question. time. Do you think they have exceed, uh, over-exceeded last yeah, season? absolutely. And I think that's the problem. I think no one expected them to finish in those Champions League places. Yeah. They got to the final of the, the Carabao Cup. So all of a sudden, there's an expectation that comes with Newcastle now that they should be, you know, knocking on that, that first place. You know, they should be up there. Mm. And I don't think they're quite there yet. 
I still think there's a lot that needs to be done with the team. I think another top four finish would be a good season for them. Mm. And everyone's having a panic because they've lost against uh, uh, Liverpool. They lost against uh, Man City, as you said, two tough games. I think they're doing okay. I think they'll be okay. I just um, think, you know, he's made a couple of changes to the team, spent a bit of money. And it takes time to, 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 to get them blend in. I just... just just an expectation with the Geordies at the moment that they they should be pushing mm. on to. to who who would them. who's out there? Yeah. I mean, I, I, his phone would be ringing off the hook. I mean, if he lost, if he loses another game, let's yeah. face it. I mean, he, Eddie knows he needs a win as as soon as he possibly can. But Dan Ashworth and the owners there, their phone will be run ringing off the hook. Everyone wants that job. Yeah. Everyone it is a job you want to go and get. It's in the Premier League. It's the best league in the world, and they got more money than God. Who wouldn't want it? I don't know how many people would want that Champions League group, though. Wow. <laughs> when the draw oh, came going, out. Oh. Out, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of that draw, Les, oh, for man, them? I, just, I, I thought to myself, look, they've done so well to get there. And then all of a sudden, they wake up in the morning and they've got that as a draw. You yeah. think to yourself, we're going out straight away, didn't you? But um, as I said, it's it, it's building stages. And, and I think that's the... That's where the Geordies at the moment, all, all people around it are, are scared that they don't make the Champions League again. Because mm. uh, listen, they're getting knocked out of that. They're yeah. getting knocked out of that, <laughs> that, 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 uh, that yeah. group that they're in. It, it's never easy to go and play there never. under lights. Never. In, I mean, I see when, when you guys yeah. were, used to Champions League, it was it's tough. And you got some fantastic results there, you know. So it's never, never going to be easy, but with the lack of experience, you'd have to fancy the other teams. They got AC Milan as their first game. <laughs> no, I know. I was trying to forget it. Like, go I'm not yeah. sure they're great. You no, know, okay. exactly. Yeah, I, I know they they had a great run of it, but sold 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 their best player to Newcastle, <laughs> to Nali. So yeah. listen, there's. I think they've got an opportunity to get through it. I really do, but I think they're going to need everything to go their way, and that, that experience of being there and done it. Unfortunately, they haven't got. They've got a few players who have played in the Champions League, so hopefully they can send a message out to the rest of the group and uh, and get positive results. But the crowd will be unbelievable. Yeah, best of luck to them. What a draw that was. Yeah. <sighs> Crikey. <laughs> um, in terms of the other English team's draws, of course, Man United have drawn Bayern Munich, which means we will see Harry Kane at Old Trafford, although probably not in the way that the United <laughs> fans were hoping. Um <laughs> Do you think that Harry Kane is destined to haunt United? Um, and yes, what do what do you think we're going to see from him when he when he plays them? I think in the way that Harry plays, he's destined to haunt anyone. You know, he's he's, he's out and out best striker in the world at the moment. Um, he's up there with the best of them. So um, I don't care who he plays against. It Man United, Man City, uh, Liverpool. He's he's going to haunt. Them. He wants to score goals. He always scores goals. He knows how to do it. Um, he's, he's proved that he's the best in the Premier League for for many years. And um, he's got a new le le lease of life now. It just proves there's what state Man United are in, doesn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, when we played, when we were growing up, if Man United come knocking on your door, you go. You're gone. Yeah, you go. And I'm not talking about the individual. Yeah. Just you've got no choice. Yeah. They would go to Tottenham and they would have said, he's our player, mm -hmm. we're going to give you X amount and they would get the deal done. Mm -hmm. Man United are not in that pond anymore. They're fishing in a different pond. It's a shame. Yeah. Um, it, it's... When I look at the manager as well, he seems to he seems to want to sign players that he's he's worked with before. Um, hadn't worked with Harry, a big personality coming into the football club. I'm not sure how he would have dealt with that, but um, as you said, uh, Man United come knocking at your door. Um, it's one of the clubs that you'd look at and go, yeah, that's where I want to go. I'm not sure. Looking at it now, I'm not sure whether Harry would have thought that would have been at 30 years of age the place for him to go to. No, well, he wants to win. Yeah. And he, and he would think there's more chance of going to win at Bayern Munich. And I've said on here before, if it's good enough for Pep, yeah. you know, to go there in his palm as a manager, it's good enough for Harry Kane. <laughs> I think it's a great move. And I think they will challenge on all fronts. Yeah. Do you think Man United went for him in the summer? No. I don't think they did because uh, I'm not sure that Daniel Levy would have wanted to sell him there. But if they wanted to bid £150 million, I'm not sure he would have cut his nose off to spite his face. He would have done the deal. Um, so I don't think they were there. I really, I really don't. Um, obviously, Rasmus Hoyland is was the target. Les said he's worked. He likes the players who he's worked with before. I think they need a lot more than Harry Kane. I, I 
initially from the outside, I thought they had a decent season last year. It was a progression season. I thought if they would have gone and said, yes, come on, Declan, we're having you and we're going to have Harry Kane, I think they would have challenged for the title. But I just think they, they got a lot more problems than that. And I'm just not sure 100% about the manager. I really am. I'm not. I mean, like I say, he did an OK job. I'm not sure that the style of play in that Dutch league translates to, to the Premier League. Um, I'm not sure any Dutch managers really done it on a on a consistent basis at the top level. Van Gaal did okay, won a few trophies, but it's not what Man United want. They need a top top level manager who's going to challenge Pep Guardiola, and uh, I'm not sure they got the players or the coaching staff to be able to do that at the moment. Well, talking about great managers, you lovely segue in there for me, Tim, because last week... I on the Sam was coming yes. in. <laughs> <laughs> Last week we built our ultimate Premier League player. Well, on this episode, we thought we would do our ultimate manager. So between you, we're going to wow. build our ultimate manager. Um, I've got four categories for you. So obviously using your experience as a director of football and as players and as a manager. So... Who, I mean, and you can't say Pep for everyone, okay, Tim? (laughs) Because we know you love Pep. Um, Okay, so uh, first category of the four, ultimate manager, tactician. It's easy for me. I think the best tactician I ever worked with was Terry Venables. Wow. I'd go with that. I mean, having worked with with Terry, I think he was ahead of his time. He He was totally ahead of his time. The way he set you up made you feel... You never really, I remember, Les, concentrated on the opposition. It was always right, trying well, to impose yourself on, on 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 the opposition himself rather than defensively, you know. And it, and I think he was ahead of time with that. So I, I'm happy to go with him. I always felt he was able. He was able to. The, there wasn't a player that went out on the field that didn't know what he was supposed to do and when he was supposed to do it and how he was supposed to do it. Um, and that might not might might not make a lot of sense because you, everyone will say we were supposed to know that. But I think sometimes players go out and they're not 100% sure. You never, ever felt that with Terry and, and, and tactically, he was just the best. I didn't get on with him. I think I, Personality-wise, I didn't get on with him, but I just felt he was the best tactician I ever worked. You still knew what you were doing, yeah. yeah 100%. Love that. Okay. I just so sat on the bench. How did Pep get left? <laughs> I knew you were sitting on the bench. <laughs> how did Guardiola miss that? Well, you've got three other ones you could put him in for. Well, um, man management. Oh, no, I wouldn't put him on for that. He doesn't have to be a good man manager, does he? You know, he's at Man City. You just leave him out and get another one. <laughs> um, oh, let's have a think about this. Come, you want to come back? To yeah, you'll come back to you on that. Yeah, yeah man, man management. management. That's, that's just... I like how serious you're taking it. I appreciate yeah, that. You're yeah. not just saying the first name that came to your mind. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like that as well. I'm, I'm thinking, who's the best man manager? I had? Is it someone we've had or anyone out anyone there? We look from the outside. No it's, no really, it's really hard to look from the yeah. outside because yeah, you need to be in the dressing room every single day to see how they react. And okay, that you t- from I what I'm reading, you've one. not had one. I think that's a tough one because you're always going to say different things because you're going to you, you you know you'll you'll look at a manager and you think yeah he's a great man management manager and then when you speak to players that work with him and go yeah because <laughs> yeah. he looks like he's a great man manager from the outside but when you speak to players that have actually worked with him yeah. I've done that on several occasions where I thought a manager was a re- really yeah. good man manager and when you speak to the players that play with him go you're out you're not yeah. Wow. yeah so I would say from the outside looking in Jurgen must be up there as a good yeah man manager yeah. it looks like he's got a good camaraderie with the players well certainly when they win but yeah. we know that it's easy to do when you win exactly it's and how even, you're treating them when you lose it's when and, you know coming off the pitch as well um, where he goes and he hugs every player and I'm not saying that's to be all and end all but sometimes if you're not happy as a player when a manager comes to hug you <laughs> you don't hug him do you know what I mean you walk straight past but everyone seems to Ooh, okay. uh, everyone seems to warm to him in terms of that okay okay let's do Jürgen then right press conferences can I throw Neil Warnock in before we go any further? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got, I, I mean, for me, I'd, 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 the best I've probably seen and people would have liked him and wouldn't have liked him was Alex. Okay. 
Okay. He had them wrapped around his little finger. Mourinho, yes, Mourinho was up there as well in terms of having all the press wrapped around his little finger. Yeah. Or our own Sam. He's not bad at a press no, conference. That's good. I mean, yeah. like, you asked him one question, you just keep talking because Sam was very cute because he knows they're on a time limit. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so they yeah. can't ask him anything else. They just keep talking. And say, no, I'm not finished yet. And you're not going to say, shut up, Sam, are you? Because he's just going to slap you. Yeah. <laughs> or he Sam says something good. that deflects the whole yes. conversation yeah. onto something else. I'll tell you, he's a master. Okay. Master of, of uh, a little bit of spin is Roberto Martinez. Okay. I think at times I've watched their games and, and listened to the press conference after and he's looking at a different game to one I saw. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if you look at his press conferences, you'll be like, wow, how unlucky were they today? They might have got beat 4-0. But the way he spins it, he's so positive, he's clever. You know, he knows who he's talking to. Because when you're, when you're in front of that, conference you're not only talking to the guys who are in in the room you're talking to your players you're talking to yeah. the directors you're talking to the fans first and foremost and I think he mastered all of that um, and I think he's obviously a very good manager as well which helps but I just think he can cover over the cracks um, with the some of the words what he says at times and and I think that's an art and what better, I'm not, better than Mourinho think about Mourinho and what he used to do and how he used to do it. Yeah, I just, with Jose, I, when he first come on the scene, I used to love him. I used to think, oh, great. But then it just got a bit tedious, and, yeah, and boring, you know, and, and I, know, I know what you're saying, but what I'm saying is every single course that I went on during my, my, my you know, doing my badges and my pro license and everything, whenever they, whenever the press people came in to talk to you about it on, on a certain day, all they'd ever do was talk about Mourinho and how he'd done it. Yeah. How he wraps them around his little finger, and and he got them, and and he would he would go off he would go off the, he would never talk about the game if they played badly he'd never talk about the game it was Shane Kelsey who'd take it somewhere else and, yeah. and the press guys were like well I've just and I used to think I've just asked you about that and you've totally talked about that over there and by the end of it it was he had them tongue tied I mean I remember Sir Alex saying to me once he said there's two games a week one's a football match and one's a press conference <laughs> and it's almost more important you win the press conference. Yeah. And he's probably right. That's who I first Sir said. Alex then. That's who I yes. first said, Sir Alex. Okay. He's a master. Yeah, the last one I have for you. You can add another category in, by the way, if you want. Okay. Uh, training ground coach. Pep. Who's the best? We've got our Pep. We've got our Pep in there. Surely. We have to have yeah. Pep in some category. And I mean, we talk enough about him, so we don't have to elaborate. Pep. I didn't say anything because I thought we weren't allowed to mention Pep on this show. Because <laughs> he already said, like, because I think I'd have given him all three categories already. Okay. But you said so, I could, we couldn't mention Pep, so I just, I just left him out. But yeah, no, nah, for, for sure. I love that. So we're having Pep as our ultimate <laughs> manager. But if we, ha if I'm making you break it down, we're having Terry Venables, Jurgen Klopp, Sir Alex Ferguson, and then Pep. Yeah, yeah it's not what, bad, eh? Oh, that would be some, that would yeah. be some manager. I'll tell you, the, the training ground manager, the Zerbi has to come very close because you can see quite clearly that he works tirelessly into, into a shape. Um, but he's got a long way to go. Okay. Right, this is the part of the podcast, Les, where we do quick fire questions. Okay. So um, I've got some. So you can elaborate. You don't need to just, it's not yes or no. You can elaborate a bit, but we'll, okay. we'll whiz through them. So who will finish higher this season, Spurs or Newcastle? Ooh, oh, jeez. Les is allowed to be on the fence, isn't he? Yeah, can I uh, be a bit... I mean, is your safety in jeopardy if you're not fence. on the fence? Uh, to be fair, I was, listen, I think everyone knows growing up as a, I was a, as a Spurs fan and, I, I, you know, I loved the Geordies and, but, you know, I don't think as a boy you ever forget who you support. So I know what I'd like to see, but um, whether they will or not, I'm not quite sure. They've started off the season on fire, yeah. um, Spurs. Um, it's whether they can maintain that. I, I think it'd be very close. Um, I think they've had a great start, Tottenham. They had a great start last year, won seven out of the first 10. Mm -hmm. So I think Tottenham fans need to calm a little bit, but it's encouraging. The guy can play football. He knows what he wants. And with the Spurs fans, I think the reason why they're, 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 they're getting excited now, it's not because style. they're winning. It's just the style that they're playing. And I think they, yeah. they won the seven games, but no one is happy about how they won the seven games last season. I think this season, they're just happy with what they're, what, what they're watching. Well, without doubt, whoever finishes... The highest out of these two finishes in the Champions League for me. Okay. But it's like down that. to five, isn't it, this yeah. year? Who's your five? That wasn't on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Man City, Liverpool. Man United, after criticising them so much. But obviously, Rasmus is going to pull it out yeah, of the Arsenal. bag for him. <laughs> Arsenal. 
Arsenal before Man, Man United. Yeah. Oh, no, not in, not in order. Oh, right, sorry, not in order. Sorry, okay, sorry. sorry. And then Spurs or Newcastle? Spurs or Newcastle. So you've, you've got Chelsea nowhere near? I think they've got it all to do. Uh, and the, the, the problems where they need a good sporting director, get rid of all the <laughs> dead wood. <laughs> <laughs> could, Quick. You, could you see both Newcastle and um, Tottenham? Yeah, in there? possibly. But I just think if, if that's going to happen, Man United have got to have a bad season. I think Arsenal are pretty yeah. much guaranteed. Man City, 100%. Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah. So then, then you're looking at Man United falling out of bed. It could happen. Brighton. Villa. <laughs> We're just naming teams now. <laughs> <laughs> good team. Yeah, good team. <laughs> okay, um, another listener question. I love this one from Mo. This is for you, Les. Mo. If the nine other players were exactly the same and you're all playing at your peak, which partnership scores more goals? Ferdinand and Shearer or Ferdinand and Sheringham? Oh, Ferdinand and Shearer all day long. I love playing with Teddy. Teddy was a good player, but I think, you know, you just have to look at Alan's goals and um, add mine to his. And um, I think we'd end up, yeah, it's all Decent goals. amount of goals. Yeah. <laughs> yes, love that. Okay, North London derby is coming up. How many Spurs players get into the Arsenal eleven? Ooh. Wow. Um, oh. Oh, God, I'm thinking today. I, I, I've done this before and not one Arsenal player got into my Tottenham team. Now it's the other way around. Um, so I'm not totally biased. Um, Harry Kane would have, but no more Harry Kane. Just more of a compliment to Tottenham because it's more of a collective group now. Um, I don't know. Come back to me. I'm okay. not. I don't okay. think at the moment. Like, there's not one standing out to okay. get into the into their team. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting on the. I'm not sitting on the fence. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, who do who do I change out of the Arsenal squad? I was. I went goalkeeper. Nope. Right back. Nope. Centre backs. Nope. Jeez. Vicario. I don't know because I don't know enough about him. He started off very very well. Yeah. Uh, round, but, but at the moment, you're not. You're not at this moment in time. You wouldn't. Mm -hmm. No, no. Not at this moment in time. So, field players, jeez, no. I'm sure I was just thinking of Son, but then you're gonna leave, who are you gonna put? You're gonna leave out Saka, Martinelli, yeah. Odegaard. <laughs> Can't leave Odegaard out. It has no, to be in your team. Saying, yeah. You know, Odegaard's got to go in where Madison would would go in. I mean, at the moment, if Madison can keep the performances going and the consistency of the performances, we've seen him have these spells at Leicester. I think he's got better players around him now. So hopefully he can continue playing on a regular basis like he is and then he would have a chance. But I'm not sure where I can fit him in at right this moment because Odegaard has to be in before him. Oh, gosh. So, <laughs> Well, we did, we did guarantee right. Arsenal win to the Champions League. We're not sure about Spurs or... So, you did yeah. okay. I feel like we should ask, we should do this question Jeez. again in six months and yeah, see um, yeah. things might yeah. be better. See how wrong yes. we were. Yes, we'll do it for the second North London derby and we'll, 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 we'll <laughs> yeah. compare. Um, Les, which current, champ which current championship player will be the next Premier League star? Current, there's one at QBR that I thought was going to really be a, a, a massive uh, Premier League star, and Chrissy Willock. I thought he was going to go all the way because he's. He's got so much ability. Um, who would I put my? I mean, there's there's a, there's a few going across my mind at the moment. Let me come back to that. Let okay. me come back to that. Okay, we're having a Future. good think on this podcast mm, yeah, today. Know, yeah, yes, we are. Aren't we? we're taking it very serious. Sunderland, I think. Yeah. Good young side, Sunderland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. QPR play Sunderland this weekend. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Um, would you two ever go into a job as a partnership? Oh yeah. Yeah. Did you love that? Yeah. You both said yes straight yeah. away. Well, we, okay. Well, we, yeah, yeah. we worked together before. Golfers. Yeah. We, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's, the, who's the caddy? Yeah. Chris, Ra Chris Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love that. It was a definite yes. There was no thinking on that one. Um, is there any players that you almost signed at QPR that you regret missing out on? Um, yeah, there was there was a few players that we we tried to bring, but we just because of the finances of the football club, um, we weren't we weren't able to bring them into the, into the club. It wasn't that they turned us down or anything like that. We just we just couldn't afford. There was a lot of players I wanted to bring to the football club that we um we we, we couldn't get couldn't get across the line um, in the end. So yeah, there, there was uh, quite a few, not just one. 
quite a few. Um, and uh, finally, do you have any Big Sam stories that you can share with us from your time at Bolton? Remember, he's not here, but he still might hear them. But have you got anything that Big you can Sam. share with us? Oh, do you know, um, I, I, I say to people all the time, <laughs> I remember when I, when I signed, um, I, I sort of made the decision I wanted to retire. Uh, and Big Sam brought me out to Spain and persuaded me to play for another year. He had all the stats of my previous year. And it was the first time I'd sat down with a manager who had this dossier and what I did in the, the last season and how many goals I scored and how many forward runs I'd made. And he had everything. And he went to me, you've still got too much to offer football. And I thought that just kind of like, massage my ego a little bit do you know what I mean mm. I thought okay yeah let me play for another year and then um, I remember going to uh, I remember going then to, to do my medical I went and done the medical and then the, the sports scientist went to me right we're going to do these runs I went what runs are they he was going uh, to look at your fitness levels I said hang on a minute mate I said <laughs> I ain't the one who said I want to come here. Sam was the one who said he wants to bring me and he wants me to carry on. I ain't doing these runs. I did one of them and I went, yeah, nah, that's it. He don't want to sign me. He don't have to sign me. That's it. I'm off. And he just picked me stuff up and I went. But like, um, no, Sam was, Sam was good. I, I, one, of, one of the things that happened was, I do remember, we uh, Bolton started off on fire that season. And it was, yeah, they finished in the Champions League uh, or qualified for Europe. Not Champions League, sorry, qualified for Europe. And um, season started off really well and winning games, winning games, winning games. And we got to around about October, October, November, and the game started to go. We started to lose a few. And then uh, he, Sam was very scientific about, um, you know, how he, how he approached every game, how he approached training and so on and so forth. And I can remember one day we, we went out to, to train. Uh, he was, fitness coach always used to come out after drinks and stuff. And then um, Sam came out in the morning and Sam never really came out in the morning. He came out after we'd started doing the warm up and all that. And he was out to do the warm up. So um, I nudged uh, Fernando Hero and I went, What's going on here? So anyway, the fitness coach comes out and he goes to him, Where the hell are you going? So he says, I'm, I'm going to go do the warm up. So he said, I don't think I need you today. So I, was, so I said to him, um, I take it the scientific approach has gone out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you what he repeated back to me, but like, <laughs> he went to me and Fernando here because we the older players, you two can F off over there. And he took them on a run. I was like, okay, yeah, the scientific approach has gone did, out the um, window. When you played at Bolton, Les, did you ever fly a helicopter up there yourself? Um, you can fly a helicopter? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes, I did. Um, I didn't fly to the training ground. I used to fly to, to Barton, uh, airfield and I used to leave my helicopter there, go to training. And I used to uh, buy a helicopter. I used to keep, well, <laughs> not, not no, no, helicopter, no, no. his <laughs> helicopter. <laughs> I've been in it. I've been in this, been in I've been in it with him. Really it's just me and him. I mean, he's so sensible. If it was me, he had hold of it, I would have gone, oh, Les, I'm in trouble. Like, winding him up. But he's, uh, no, I remember we flew over London Coney and Arsenal's training ground and never again, mate. <laughs> What colour is your helicopter, by the way? It's, it was really funny because when I um, I had a blue and white helicopter. Why is that, man? Um, I just feel like has it got his face like painted across yeah, the side no, of it or no, something. I had a blue and white one, and it was it was it was something that um, when I was up at Newcastle, um, some geezers sort of like Keegan had done something in a, in, a, in in one of the programs saying, look, you know, uh, and he'd said to me, look, you're in a goldfish bowl. Um, you know, London, you can get lost, you can go all over the place and people don't bother you up here, you're in a goldfish bowl, you won't be able to do this, that and the other. What do you want to do? So I said, okay, I want to learn how to cook, I want to learn how to play saxophone, I want to learn how to ride a motorbike. He said, I might be able to help you with two of them, but the third, I'm not sure I can help you. So I said, okay. And I goes, but that's what I really want to do. I want to learn how to ride a motorbike. And he said, well, look, I've got a motorbike that uh, Harley, Harley Davidson up there had made for him. He said, if you promise to ride that to my house, I'll let you do that as well. So I said, okay. So I learned how to ride a motorbike. I learned, learned how to play saxophone and I learned how to cook. And then um, some guy, a fella come on and he said, do you want to learn how to fly a helicopter? And at first I was like, no, 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 no. And then he called me again and I went, oh, I'll come out on a trial run. Came out on a trial run. And so I was, I thought, first time I went up in it, I was like, do I really want to do this? Well, yeah, I'm going to do it. And so I learned how, while I was at Tottenham, I learned how to, to pass my, I passed my test and I went to Bowen. I'd had, had my own helicopter and I thought, do I, Drive three, three hours up the motorway, or do I take an hour to fly to Barton? So I just flew to Barton, got a taxi to train in, and then I used to come back and I used to stay in the hotel. I used to live in the, I used to live in the, the Larry. So as many days as Sam wanted me up here, I'd stay up here, and then after that, fly back to London. 
Wow. I love that as a little drop right at the end of the episode. Do you still play saxophone and do you still cook? I still cook. I don't play saxophone anymore. Yeah. Um, I got back to London and had too many distractions. So. <laughs> <laughs> we hear that about London a lot. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much pleasure. for pleasure. coming on. It's been a real pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you for opening your little black book today and bringing your friend. Pleasure. And thank you for coming in there, being an excellent caretaker boss as always. Thank I you. really enjoyed it today. All good. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us on another episode of No Tippy Tappy Football brought to you by William Hill. We will be back next week and Sam will be back. <laughs>